right in Acts chapter 13 and verse 26. If you'll remember now, there's been a, a change of leadership, if you will, in the sense that Paul has now taken the primary role in the missionary leadership of, of uh, the pair of uh, Paul and Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas sort of took Paul by the hand, was leading him around and giving him uh, uh, encouragement. And, and now Paul has, has grown in, in his position, in his ability to share the faith with others. And so he's become quite powerful in the, in the Lord and in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so here he's taking the charge. We're in the middle of his, of his sermon that he's giving in Antioch, in Pisidia, a different uh, Antioch. And he's in the middle of this sermon. And so he says in verse 26, Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, obviously speaking to Jewish people, and those among you who fear God, to the word of this salvation, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. And so he's talking about those among you who fear God. Those were probably proselytes or bro proselytes in training or uh, candidates for, being, for converting to Judaism. They feared the one God, and so they wanted to join forces with the Jewish people. And so he's, he's talking to them, and he says that this word of salvation has been delivered to you. And we see from this that God is not a respecter of persons when it comes to salvation. He wants to receive all, and he wants everyone to be saved. So if you're thinking about going out and talking to someone about the Lord, you can take your pick, because you could talk to anyone and bring them to faith in Christ. Now, this in this day was a bigger deal, if you will, because in that group of people were Gentiles. And that's where the big rub is going to come in in the next couple of chapters as they start to focus in on what Paul has been doing with the Gentiles. It's going to be a problem for the Jewish leadership. But Paul was called to the Gentiles, and that's his ministry. Verse 27, For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. Now, verse 27 is talking about their habits within the Sabbath worship service. They would gather together and read from the Holy Scriptures. They would read from what we call the Old Testament. That was their Scripture, the, the prophets, the Old Testament, written down on their scrolls, and they would gather together on Sabbath day and open up the scrolls and read from them, and then they would expound and talk about what they mean. And that's sort of what we do, only they only had the Old Testament. And as they were reading the Old Testament, what Paul is telling this crowd is that while they were reading the Old Testament, they were telling you about this Jesus that I'm telling you about now. They just didn't realize that when they rejected Christ and had him put to death, they actually were fulfilling the same scriptures that they had been reading for centuries because it was predicted that Jesus would die. In verse 28, And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. So they, Paul clearly making, making the point that Jesus was an innocent victim. They found nothing worthy of death. There was no cause that they should put him to death Nonetheless, they convinced Pilate that he should be put to death. And the reason this was allowed, and I say it was allowed, because this was the plan of God. Men were not in control of Jesus' life. This was God's plan, that Jesus would become the Lamb of God, take our sins upon himself, and go to the cross where he would pay for the sins of the world. It was the plan of God. Nothing could have prevented him from going for this reason, Jesus said, I came into this world. And so he uh, only went the plan of the Father and the people involved all played their role, so to speak. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. And so Paul giving a clear history of how things went down on that, on that uh, event. And in verse 30, but God raised him from the dead. 
He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. Now I imagine as he tells this story in the synagogue, uh, the, the people are, are whispering and they're saying, what did he just say? He rose from the dead? What is he talking about? Listen, we talk about it in church and we sort of just kind of blow right past it like it's no big deal. To them it was a big deal. This was, um, are you saying he rose from the dead? Well, it's part of our Christian knowledge, our Christian teaching. Our Jesus, the history, the story, the, the gospel tells us Jesus rose from the dead. We've accepted it, we believe it, and so we talk about it almost flippantly. But when Paul was delivering this for the first time, you can only imagine what the people were probably thinking about when they were hearing this, as we're going to see many different reactions will come from it. And so notice in verse 29, they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him. That's when all of this started to kind of close down, run down, as God raised him from the dead. He was seen by the many witnesses. And de we declare to you, verse 32, glad tidings, good news, that promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for you, for us, for all of us. His children and God's uh, plan was for every human being who has sinned. And that includes everybody. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second psalm, Psalm 2, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and that he raised him from the dead no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption, meaning the decay of the grave. Jesus was taken out of the grave, risen from the dead, before decay or the normal rotting of the body could take place. This was significant. He mentions the mercies of the sure mercies of David. It had to be that uh, Jesus rose from the dead. He had, uh, had he been allowed to, to corru corrupt or, or rot in the grave, then the blessings of David would not have been given to him or awarded to him because the blessings of David was a messianic blessing. In fact, he's going to talk about it in just a moment, as we'll see, regarding it to David in verse 36, that David, after he had served his own generation, by the will of God, fell asleep. Now that's a euphemism for he died. He died. He fell asleep. Now don't be afraid to go to sleep tonight. That's not what you should be worried about. This is just the saying that is used. He fell asleep and was buried with his father's and he, David, saw corruption. In other words, when David died, they put him in the grave, and he stayed in the grave. And after the natural period of time, his body decayed and went back to the earth. And that's what he's saying here. So David didn't even receive the sure mercies of David. That was the promise that was made to the ancestry of David, in specific, the Messiah, who would come through the lineage of David. And so here is this, uh, the Apostle Paul explaining how this is working to uh, be passed on to Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah, is basically what he's saying. Verse 37, but he whom God raised up saw no corruption, speaking of Jesus. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, this man Jesus, through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. That was the, the purpose of the Messiah, the plan of God through the Messiah that forgiveness of sins would be offered to all people. And by him, this is a key verse, this is a huge gospel verse, by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Do you see that? There were certain things that the law of Moses could, in a sense, purge you of, 
but never really make you completely innocent or guiltless or justified, never sinned. That's, if you think of the word justified, think of it in that way. Justified, never sinned. As if I had never committed a sin. Notice it says here, by him, everyone who believes in Jesus is justified. To believe. It's that simple. You know, religion has made it so complicated, but it's that simple. To believe in Jesus Christ is to be justified from everything which the law was incapable of committing upon your life. You could not be as clean if you kept the law 100% than if you simply just believe in Jesus Christ, you would be justified from all sin. Now, listen, that is such good news. It's good news. Think about where you've been and what you've done. Think of all the sins that you have created. You believe in Jesus Christ and all of it is wiped away. He has taken your sins and, and tossed them away. As far as east is from the west, you will never be joined to those sins again. You're justif justified. Justified never sinned before clean now listen you have to do some wrestling on that because we don't think that way in the natural mind in the natural mind we want to you know pay back we got to you know i got to pay people back i got to apologize for this i got to apologize in christ it's done it's over we come to him and we believe by faith that he is the messiah he is the one who washes away my sins now i don't understand how he does it and I don't have to understand. I mean, yes, I can give you a theological reason, but a lot of it, wow, it doesn't even make sense to me, but it, it doesn't have to. It says it, and so I'll believe it and watch as the, the weight of your sin is, is taken from you. That is the wonder of, of his grace. It is by grace you've been saved. It's a gift of God. It's nothing you can do by being good or undoing what you've already done in a negative way. You cannot undo what you've done. And we're all looking for this justification. I, I wish I could take it back. Well, guess what? In Christ, you don't have to because he took it for you. And he took it to the cross, and there he nailed it. He nailed it dead. And now you stand clean before the Lord. What's more, he says, come on in. You're always welcome. You come in. You always come in boldly into the throne of grace to ask for any help that you need from him. And everything you've done is, is washed clean, justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. The law was a lesser plan than this divine plan of God to send Jesus to the cross. Everything. Everything. You're washed clean. Now, people will have a hard time forgetting, <laughs> but God doesn't. It's all gone, all washed away. Beware, therefore, verse 40, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Meaning, this is what the Old Testament is, is, is declaring. Behold, you despisers or, or you rejecters, those of you who would reject God's grace, Marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. This is a prophecy from Habakkuk, Habakkuk in the first chapter, where God is saying, I'm going to show you something that, that, that you're, you're just not going to believe it. Even if I were to tell it to you, you wouldn't believe it. It's such a fantastic thing. And you think about it. Habakkuk was the story where God is telling Habakkuk, prophesying through Habakkuk, that he's going to, to wipe out the Jewish nation. He's going to send them out of their land. He, he's, he's going to evict them. The temple was going to be destroyed, and all of this was predicted. And, and all the people may have been thinking, oh, what a terrible thing, what a terrible thing. And God is saying, oh, no, it's such a wonderful thing. Watch what I'm going to do. Watch how I send into this world. I'm going to send you so far into this world, you're not even going to remember you have a nation, but your heart will be pining for it. You're going to want it. And in a few hundred years, they're going to say, let's rebuild Jerusalem and let's send some Jews back there to do it. Watch what I'm going to do. 
And it won't be long after you're there. You're not going to own the place. You're just going to live there. But you're not going to own it. You will always have someone else ruling over your country. And then I'm going to send a miraculous seed into the Virgin Mary. And she's going to conceive and bear the child who will bring salvation into this world. But then I'm going to kill him. And I'm going to bring him back from the dead. And he's going to live forever forever. Watch what I'm going to do, but be careful lest you shouldn't believe it. Just believe. Remember, believe is how you're justified. If you don't believe, then you're still in your sins. It's that simple. So beware. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, his, his sermon is over now. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Well, these are words of grace. These are, these are, this is a message of grace. They're, they're hearing this for the first time. These are these, the Gentiles, of course, received it because these proselytes, right, they're having to play by the rules of the Jewish faith. And they're looking down the barrel of a circumcision and they're saying, wow, I don't know if I want to do this. This is huge. And Paul suddenly stands up and says, you don't have to do any of that. Really? Give us more. Tell me more. And the Jews had laws after laws. You know, we think the Ten Commandments. No, the Jewish faith has a lot, hundreds of commandments. Nobody could keep the law. But now they're being told, this is how you become a Jew. If you want to be a follower of the one true God, this is what you have to do. Now you go home and you study it. And when you've learned it, then we're going to give you the test and you're going to be able to be circumcised. You're going to be go through the ritual baptisms and then you can become a Jew. And Paul's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not necessary. Just believe. And you're going to be freer than if you kept the entire law. Uh, let me see, which one do I want to believe in? Um, hey, Paul, can you tell us some more about this? We want to hear more about it. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Don't get tripped up by the words. Look, listen, we've been talking about it in 1 Timothy on Sunday morning, how there were those who were coming in to try and put them under law. And Paul says, don't let these guys teach that stuff. We're about grace. This is not about law, this is about grace. And Paul says, you stay in the grace of God. Don't let these guys pull you in. Don't fall for it. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Isn't that great? They, they heard about this and this great commotion took place as people were, were moving to this message of grace. They weren't rushing to the synagogue to hear the law. They were running to the synagogue to hear about this message of grace and the giver of grace who is God through his son Jesus. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming they oppose the things spoken by Paul. And religion in many ways is frightened for this message of grace because religion kind of makes its bacon, if you will, on the rules that it invents for mankind. Let me tell you, a lot of people, even in the Christian church, are fearful of the message of grace because it almost sounds as if it's a cheap salvation. It almost sounds as if if you buy into the message of grace, well, then you've got a license to sin, any, do anything you want to do. But that's not the message of grace at all. The message of grace tells us that salvation is a gift from God. It's free. Enjoy it. God loves you, and he wants you to enjoy him. That's the message of grace. And it's not the do's and the don'ts. It's the come and I will do it for you. It's as simple as that. It's so beautiful. It's so liberating. And Christians in churches for years never capture that liberating message. I hope you will see it here. Paul is saying you stay in the grace of God. Don't go to the law or the do's and the don'ts. Well, the Jews hated that. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, 
it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, meaning the Jewish people. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Well, we're, we're going to go where the fish are biting. <laughs> we're not going to stay here in this pond. If you're, if you're not going to bite, we're, we're, we're going to just take our bait and go elsewhere. That's what any fisherman would do, right? These are evangelists. Jesus said, I call you to be fishers of men. So don't stick your line in the pond and, and expect something to bite if after 10 years nothing's been biting. It's time to pull up your, your, your bobber and get out of there. That's the point. We'll go somewhere else. There's a lot of fish out there that want to get saved. They want to, they, they're jumping into our boats. And so we spend a lot of time trying to pound it into someone's head like, as if we've got to win this fight. No, you don't. You don't have to win the fight. They're not ready to get saved. Go on to the next pond. and Wait till you have an opportunity to talk to someone else. You, you don't have to ram this down anyone's throat. This is a message of grace. If you can't see it, well, you've just judged yourself unfit and unworthy for salvation. You're unworthy of it. Fine, I'll go somewhere else. There's a lot of people out there that want it. Let it go. You don't have to battle this fight. We need to know when to let go when to quit fighting you don't need to win the debate you just need to to throw out the bait and watch them eat it if they're not going to eat it then they just don't have the eyes for it verse 47 for so the lord has commanded us i have set you as a light to the gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth and when the gentiles heard this they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as have been appointed to eternal life believes. They gladly received it. They went to the right pond, and they just started receiving the word, receiving Christ. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region, freely. They went out. They didn't go where they were being resisted. Go out. Now, you know, Americans have a tough time with this because we want to stand upon our rights. I have the right to freedom of speech. Get over that. That's an American law. Go somewhere else where people will listen. Go and, and preach the gospel to people who need to hear it. And get over the other stuff. We don't have rights like that. We don't care about those rights because this country is not ours. We live in heaven. That's our home. We're heading there. We play by those rules as much as we possibly can. And the word of the Lord was being spread. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. <laughs> but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. You, you see how for them it was fine. We'll go. We'll go somewhere else. Let it be so with us. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit, which is always an indication, the joy part, that they received the gospel and were saved. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and spoke, and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and the Greeks, believed. Now it's, it was always their habit. They would go into a town and the first place they visited was the synagogue. We don't do that sort of thing. We don't typically go into someone else's church and start preaching the gospel there. We, we just don't do that. Uh, but in this day, they had to because we know that the gospel had to first be presented to the Jewish people. And Paul will talk about this later on in one of his letters. And so we, we understand that was their plan. Just go and talk. Why also the synagogue? Because in the synagogue, always the scriptures were read. And you can go to any scripture of the Old Testament and find Jesus in it. You know, you may have questioned why do we study the old testament because it's all about jesus and that's who we are we're jesus people we're christians and so anything that leads us to christ we study it and we find jesus in the old testament and of course in the new as well well here these guys went to the synagogue they would read a scripture and then someone would start talking about it and they say anyone have anything to say and paul would stand up and say yeah well actually i i have a few words i'd like to say about that passage of scripture and then the, the subject of Jesus would come up. And a great multitude, both of the Jews and the Greeks, believed. It was just so natural for him to share the gospel's message so simply, and people gobble it up. And that's what we want to do. A simple message, 
and let people make their decisions. But the, the unbelieving Jews, see there's a difference. Some believed and then some didn't believe. The unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. You remember there was that one sorcerer who did that uh, last week and, and Paul blinded, blinded the guy you know, with the power of the Holy Spirit and he wound up uh, in trouble for a time, it says, for a time. And you don't want to hinder what God is doing in the gospel. These guys were doing so, and I'm sure that they either would get saved or they're going to pay for this rejection and rebellion. Verse 3, therefore they stayed there a long time. It's interesting. They stayed there. Why? Because they were being persecuted or because so many people believed, such a great multitude believed, that they said, well, we can get persecuted, but we're not leaving. There are too many believers need to be grown up in the faith. And so they stayed there a long time speaking boldly in the Lord. It was the, in the Lord that they were speaking. In other words, the Lord was sustaining them while they were in this place. And so they were able to speak and spoke boldly in the Lord who was bearing witness to the word of his grace. Whose grace? The Lord's grace. Not Paul's grace. It's the Lord's grace. And they were speaking boldly in the power of the Lord. And uh, through that, there was a powerful witness of the word of grace. Notice, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. God granted signs and wonders to be done through even their hands. Wow. Just imagine that you would be used of the Lord in that way. But keep something in mind, and what we're going to see in this passage, in this, this passage really, is that the power did not belong to them. They were granted the privilege of being used by God to let His power go through them. They were not the possessors of signs and miracles. They were the vessels or the instruments by which signs and wonders were being used uh, by, or for the power, for the, the con confirmation of the Word of God. And it's a very important little distinction that we must be uh, very clear on, that we do our part. Our part is to speak the gospel as boldly and clearly as we possibly can. And here's the promise that Jesus will show up when you do that. You do your part and Jesus will show up. And, and our part is to go out and preach and to tell people about Jesus Christ. And then we just remain open to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Uh, sometimes what we do is we think that the bait is the signs and the wonders. It's not. That's not the bait. The bait is the truth of the gospel. Give them the word of the gospel. Listen, Paul said, faith comes by hearing the word of God, not by seeing miracles. It's the word of God. That's the bait that people will bite and grab and eat and become saved. After that, then the power of God will come and bring the miraculous or bring the, the signs, bring the changed life, bring repentance, bring so many things, wonderful things. And so uh, we want to get the priorities in the right place. And so uh, in verse um, uh, 4, it says, but the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, and the other part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with the rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of, of, of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. And so it wasn't their time to be martyrs, and so they didn't stand and uh, take, take the abuse. It was time to go. And so they left. And they knew when it was time to pull the plug. They knew when it was time to walk away from the fight instead of trying to, to fight this battle. You don't have to win the battle. You just have to do your job and leave it. It's hard to be able to do that. And they were preaching, uh, and, and they were preaching the gospel there. Well, of course. What else were they going to preach? There was nothing else to preach. 
The power to heal is not in us, but the power to preach is in us. And so we preach. When God uses us to heal or to do some miracle or to do to to um, manifest certain spiritual gifts, most of them are typically by the hand of God who works them. We just happen to be the instrument who's there at the time. But when it comes to the gospel, we own it. He has taken this treasure and placed it in these vessels, these earthen vessels. We're clay pots similar to Qumran, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain, were found and they were came, contained bits and pieces of the Bible. One entire scroll of the book of Isaiah were found inside of clay pots. Until some goat farmer, um, Bedouin boy, was trying to chase his, his goats off the cliff and threw a rock at the goats and it went into a cave and he heard this clang. He'd broken a pot. He went and found these treasured possessions that are on display right now in Israel. But that's similar to you and, and, and me. As the gospel, the precious gospel is contained within our lives. Everywhere we go, we have the gospel. And everywhere we go, we have the potential of giving it to someone and seeing them be saved. Everywhere we go. That's something we're supposed to be about. That's what verse 7 is about. They were preaching the gospel there. They weren't healing people there. They weren't, they weren't doing miraculous things there. They were just preaching the gospel because that's what they were called to do. And other things happened as they were preaching the gospel. That's their primary concern, our primary concern. In Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, notice, notice what precipitates this story. The man heard. He heard the speaking. What was Paul speaking? The gospel. They were preaching the gospel. And so here he was preaching. The man lame from his mother's womb, couldn't walk, never walked. He heard Paul speaking. Paul happened to notice the man observing and, and observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and walked. Wow. Now, what we're seeing here is how the supernatural actually happens. It's sort of like God working in all different directions at the same time, and it's required, uh, incumbent upon the servant of the Lord to be able to detect or discern what it is that the Lord is doing in that moment and at that time. Because obviously, this didn't happen all the time. You know, someone can easily read the gospel or the, the book of Acts and say, why is it that we don't have miracles anymore like in the book of Acts? Well, think something for a moment. The book of Acts is a history of about 40 years. There is about 40 miracles that happen in the book of Acts. That's about one per year. Oh, we think it's oh, so many miracles, so many miracles. Well, miracles do happen, we know, but it wasn't quite as we might imagine when we put it all together. Now, the point is, miracles do happen. This was one of those particular miracles, a healing of a man who was lame his entire life. But it didn't happen until first the gospel was preached, the man heard it, and there was, there was a, a spark of faith that happened inside of his life, and he received this message of the gospel. And Paul, seeing the man, the Spirit obviously must have spoken to him and said, that man can be healed, so here's what I want you to do. Tell him to stand up. Well, now comes another gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of faith. This is, an, uh, this is an unusual thing. You have to be able to say, get up! Imagine the faith it's required to even say it, let alone to watch him do it. Paul didn't raise the man up. You know, you envision Star Wars. Mm, you know, who was it? Uh, 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 Yoda, who had to pull the starship out of the water, right? Ooh, no, no, no. That's not how 
the Spirit of God works in your life, that's the force. That's something completely different. But the Holy Spirit did this. And God allowed Paul to be a partner in it. And he was the mouthpiece. Stand up! And the Holy Spirit put power in his bones and and straighten out his feet and his legs and wow the guy just jumped to his feet that was spirit power wonder working power that comes through the holy spirit i want to be a part of that i can i can i can dig that right there i want to be a part of that for sure now when the people saw what paul had done they raised their voices saying in the lyconian Um, uh, language the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men now this is superstition this is not truth here it's superstition now keep something in mind a divine miracle a real a genuine an authentic miracle happened but people got the wrong idea from it and from there you're going to see it doesn't end well but they got the wrong idea from it and so they were superstitious. They believed that Zeus and, and um, Hermes uh, were the gods who often came to the earth and took on the form of, of men and did miracles for people. That's, that was their superstition. And so, hey, this was them. Well, this they thought was uh, the, the real deal. They didn't think it was the power of God. They thought it was Zeus and Hermes. And Barnabas, they called Zeus, Paul, Hermes, or Jupiter and Mercury, if you prefer, because he was the chief speaker. Paul was the chief speaker. This is a, another indication that Paul sort of took the role, took the charge here. And so they thought these were gods. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. Now, it's probable that the reason Paul and Barnabas let it get this far, because they were talking in a different language. They may not have understood the language too well. And it's possible that's what was happening since they were shouting these things in the Lyconian language, it tells us there in verse 11. And so Paul and Barnabas are going, wow, these people really enjoyed that miracle. That's wonderful. And (laughs) here they are going to get all of their animals, and they're going to sacrifice them in front of Paul and Barnabas. But when the apostles, Barnabas and, and Paul, did you see that? Apostles, plural. Barnabas here is referred to as an apostle. A lot of people have debate about that. They only want to see the, the 12 minus 1 and then add Paul. It is possible Barnabas was obviously among the apostles as well. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? Now, the tearing of the clothes is what Jewish tradition would do whenever something blasphemous was taking place. Ah, how could you be doing this? And they were ripping their clothes, not ripping them off and, you know, going naked. They just ripped their robe, and that sound was like, blasphemy, how could this be done? Why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are. And God is the one who healed that man, not us. That's what he's saying. We didn't do this miracle. God did this miracle. So why are you giving us the praise? What do you mean by offering animals to us? We're just like you. We have a nature just like you except that we're servants of the Most High God, and we want you to be a servant of the Most High God. That, that's the whole message here. And he goes on to talk about the history of this God who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. God is, is a God of liberty. Do as you wish. Do as you wish. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good. So goodness that comes to all men, even unbelieving men. And you know that the rain, which is good, falls on the the just or the good and the ungood, the unjust alike. God is good to everybody. That's his witness. Someone 
can't see God. They're, they're just not looking in the right place because there's the goodness of God everywhere. The goodness of His nature, His creation. That God is good. There is His testimony, the witness of God. But we know as we get into Romans, we'll see that even the natural history or the natural um, uh, surroundings that, in which we live are not enough to define God clear enough for men to be saved completely. We know this. We get the ancient tribes or the Indian tribes or the, the, the people who live out in the wilderness. They, they worship God. They don't know why. They don't know whom. But they worship because their nature, the surroundings told them there's someone higher than you. Worship him or her or whatever it is. Until a missionary would come along and say, the one that you're worshiping is Jesus. You just didn't know him by name. Oh, that's who did this. And that's what they're doing here. you got to turn from these other silly things. And you got to turn to the one true God who is above all of these things. He created all of these things. He gave us the ability to, to heal, to do this work. It's him that did, does it. It's not us. But God was good and he left a witness and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling hearts, our hearts with food and gladness. This is all, these are all gifts from God. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. They couldn't restrain them. They, they were so caught up in their, in their superstitious myths. Now notice something. There was no salvation there that we know of. The, the healing took place, miraculous. And the people went crazy. It appeared as if they understood it and they got saved, but it doesn't appear that they, they turned away from their old life at all. So there was probably no genuine salvation that took place from this healing. Powerful. But miracles don't always bring salvation. Only the preaching of the gospel does. Then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul. What? They were just offering sacrifices to him. How fickle. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city because they thought he was dead. They killed him in the city with stones, and after he was, they assumed he was dead, they dragged him out of the city. You know, Paul talks about that in one of his writings in 2, Chronicle, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 11, he talks about that story when he was taken up into the third heaven. He mentions it. Uh, he mentions uh, that he was stoned once in uh, 2 Corinthians 11. I believe it was 2 Corinthians 12 where he actually talks about his journey into the third heaven. It's possible here they left him for dead because he actually was dead. And when he was dead, he had one of those, you know, uh, out of body type things where he went into the third heaven. The third heaven, there's the first heaven, is where the birds live. And then there's the, the second heaven where the stars live and the planets. And then there's the third heaven, it's the dwelling place of God. And so it's possible that Paul was given a picture, a glimpse into that eternity. And he saw it, and Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he said, there's no way that I should be allowed to, be, to repeat those things. They were too, too grand, too incredible for man to know. And so he saw it as a privilege. And supposing him to be dead, they dragged him out of the city. However, notice verse 20, when the disciples gathered around him, poor Paul, so young, life all ahead of him, does anyone want to have a few moments and say a few words over his dearly departed soul? And there they were standing over him. He rose up and went into the city. He just got right up and went into the city. You think the healing of the lame man was big. That's big. That's power. But he didn't do it. He was dead. At least we assume so. Even if he wasn't dead, do you know that stoning was as, as probably even more successful as a method of killing than crucifixion was. Stoning was a pretty good way of dying if you wanted to kill someone. You would stone them. And um, he was stoned, and apparently they'd done it before, uh, and they were successful. 
And so they dragged him out of the city, but Paul rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. The next day. The next day. Are you kidding? I've been doing a little work around here. I can barely walk. This guy gets pummeled with stones to the point to where they thought he was dead. And he can walk to the next city? I'd be calling for a taxi or something. Ambulance. You know, but Paul, it, what, the point is, it's a miracle. This is a miracle. And it's probable that, that uh, I, and we know that in this particular case, God didn't want him to be done. He wasn't finished. Comfort there, because when our time on this earth is finished, it's time to go. We don't want to stay any longer than that. When the Lord's finished with us, then it's okay to take us out. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, <laughs> they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. So here's, here's the point. This is, this is what they lived for. This is what they lived for. And they, they could have been doing so much, but this was their lives. We do a lot. We all have our lives, but we have to live for this. As our spiritual uh, priority, our spiritual mind has to be about this, this principle of filling up the kingdom of God with new souls. And everywhere we go, we want, we want to, to be used by God to, to bring people into the kingdom. We get that privilege. You may not see a miracle or you may not be used by God to do some wonderful thing, a healing or something. Then again, you might be. But that's not the point. The point is that we get to bring someone into the kingdom. That's the, the, the reason we exist on this earth. And if we'll do that, we're going to see some wonderful things. And so he came to the same place where they were picking on him and strengthening the souls of the disciples. That, that, that's, uh, again, his ministry, to strengthen the souls of those who already believed and exhorted them to continue in the faith. Earlier it was continue in grace, continue in the faith. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, continue in the faith. Some are going to depart from the faith. Don't let that be you. You continue in the faith. That's what he's saying. That's what I'm saying. Continue in the faith. And don't be moved, don't be shaken when someone takes up stones to kill you. Or when someone does something to harm you. Or, or life is hard. Life is difficult. Because life is difficult. But we have someone who walks with us through every difficulty. That's, that's our advantage. That the world doesn't have as we have. And so Paul even says that. What do you tell someone after you've just stepped out of a stoning? After you just walked out of death's jaws? You walk into their living room and you say, continue in the faith. You don't quit. Oh, yeah, it was tough. And notice what he says here in, uh, in verse uh, 22, at the end of verse 22. We must, through many tribulations, <laughs> enter the kingdom of God. You know, Paul, isn't there a back door? I'd like, I don't mind going through the back door. Does it have to be this way? But that's just the life we live because it's a spiritual thing. Look, it doesn't make sense. These guys walk into a town. There's a man who's been lame since his childhood. The Lord uses them to bring him to his feet miraculously. The whole town saw it. And still there's someone who can stir up the crowds and have them stoned for it? What is that? That's not logical thinking. It's demon thinking. That's demonic. It's spiritual is what I'm saying. Paul said it over and again. We're not wrestling against humans. There's spiritual forces out there that hate you. And they're stirring up humans to kill you. It's not the humans. It's the spiritual forces. This is the spiritual war. And brothers and sisters, we, we kind of have to take off, take off the, the veil off of our eyes to see this. We can't get hung up in the things of this world or we'll miss it altogether and we'll be ineffective for our primary goal of winning souls into the kingdom. 
So we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God because that's how the devil tries to hinder our progress. Through tribulation. He throws us the curveballs. He throws roadblocks into our progress. And it, it discourages us. And we say, oh, forget it. It's just too hard. And you can't do that. That's, that's not continuing in the faith. You have to keep going. It doesn't matter how hard it will be, and it will be hard. You keep going anyway. So when they had appointed elders in every church, it had to be done. You've got to have leaders. Always have to have leaders. A church without a leader is going nowhere. Keep that in mind. You've got to have leaders. It's God's design. Appointed leaders and elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From there, they sailed to Antioch. That was their headquarters, remember, Antioch. That was the first Antioch. They, went to, they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Commended to the grace of God. That's a beautiful saying there. I want to be commended to the grace of God. I want to, I want to be able to hear the words of my Savior say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've done everything I've commanded you to do. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I, I want to be able to say that. And I may not be able to to say that every day of my life, but I would like to be able to go and lay my head down on the pillow and be able to say, Lord, I think I've done everything you've given for me to do today. And, and to me, that's success, if you ask me. That's successful. To be able to say that I think I've done everything I was supposed to do for you today, and if not, can you give me a chance to get it tomorrow? That's, that's the idea. That, to me, is success in the Christian life. To know that I've done what the Lord has asked me to do completed it and when they had come and gathered the church together they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles yay so they stayed there a long time with the disciples so that statement there at the end of verse 27 they had opened the door to the Gentiles it sounds so wonderful but they're not going to be happy about it in the next chapter and so you want to read the next two chapters as we study this. And um, let's pray together. Lord, as we close this, uh, this chapter, halfway through the book of Acts, we are thankful for this story that has so inspired so many of us to the ministry, equipped us, and encouraged us to keep pressing onward. And I pray for anyone here today who's going through a tough time, and it's so hard for them, and and they didn't know that the Christian life was supposed to be so hard. And, and yet through many trials and tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. And so we must continue in the faith and keep walking by faith. I pray for them, encourage them, help them through their trial, be with them through every step. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.